Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Right. Welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Good morning to everyone. We are very happy to be here with you. Uh, we are going to be together for 90 minutes uh, to discuss a, a very interesting topic, uh, looking at regions as the laboratories of policy experimentation. So welcome from my side. Uh, my name is Arno Morrison. I'm one of the thematic experts for A Smarter Europe. Um, we will commemorate this uh, webinar with Mark here with us. How are you this morning, Mark? Good, thank you, Arno. Uh, good morning to everyone. A special warm welcome to our three speakers. Thanks again for your commitment to, to share your knowledge. So looking forward to this discussion, actually. It's an area where there's lots of new stuff and basically in the word experimentation means we're learning with you. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. And we here also with uh, Valentine. Good to have you uh, with us. Um, if you have any, she will make sure that everything is uh, running smoothly. And of course, of course, if you have any, any questions, uh, please uh, use the chat question for us, but also questions for our speakers. Uh, we want to make uh, this webinar as uh, interactive as, as possible. So a little bit about the speakers. Uh, we are lucky to have three excellent uh, speakers uh, with us uh, this morning. Uh, we have uh, Slavo Radosevich from, uh, from the University College of London. Good to have you with us. And we will be looking with you at the institutionalizing experimentation in innovation policies. Uh, looking at challenges and solutions in upscaling. Uh, we are going also to look at good practices. Uh, first, looking at the Lugano uh, Living Lab in Switzerland with Jan. Uh, good to have you with us from the in Digital Innovation Lead from the city of Lugano. And last but not least, uh, we are going to look at what's happening in Turin with uh, Torino Social Impact and Inno Social Metro with uh, Claudia uh, from the city of Torino. So very good to have us with us uh, this morning. And please, uh, participants, do not hesitate to use uh, the chat at any, any point. All right, before we move on to um, our presentations, uh, let's have a few words about uh, Interreg Europe. Uh, so Interreg Europe is a very uh, unique program. It's all about capacity building for European policymakers. Uh, it's very unique because it covers all cohesion priorities. It covers all European regions, all European countries, uh, plus Switzerland and Norway. And now we even have uh, seven new members, uh, countries joining us. Uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and the Balkan uh, countries. So it's great to have them. They can also participate into um, projects, but they can also participate to uh, our services and what we do with peer reviews and matchmaking. And I saw some participants from Ukraine. So good to have you uh, with us uh, this morning. So what what do we do? Um, so we um, at Intra Europe. Uh, it's the main objective is to improve uh, regional development policies. And the, the way we do, do that is through the exchange of experience, uh, capacity building is dedicated to um, policymakers. And the focus is really about uh, exchanging knowledge, learning, and experience uh, among policymakers on what's uh, happening in your regions. So two actions. 
the first one is of course the project where um, some limited number of regions they exchange knowledge and transferring good practices on the specific uh, regional development issues. So it can range from smart specialization to demonstrators to drones. I mean, it's very, very wide. And the second action, the policy uh, learning platform, which is all about uh, capitalizing all the knowledge from all the projects. And it's about diffusing uh, this knowledge uh, to as many people as possible. Of course, our community of policy maker makers, but also beyond, uh, beyond our community through uh, different activities. So the policy um, learning opportunities that we have, uh, we can do many things. Uh, you can have access to uh, knowledge to find policy solutions. Uh, you can meet our people in our community, and also we provide expertise and targeted uh, policy advice. So for instance, when we talk about uh, knowledge, what we do, um, you have this great database of good practices from all uh, over the European Union and beyond. Um, we also uh, write very nice policy briefs and news and articles, and you can have access, for instance, the latest policy brief is a very interesting one and very related to what we're talking about today, it's uh, regional missions. So our policymakers at the regional level can use this concept of missions to apply uh, this concept in their, in their regions. We also uh, provide access to people. Um, so we have this very large uh, community, but we also organize a lot of good networking and policy learning events. Um, we are going to our next workshop in in Lithuania, so stay, stay tuned. It's going to be a uh, digitization of the public sector. Finally, uh, we provide like great services free of charge uh, for um, all the countries plus the seven member, um, the seven countries participating in Inter Europe. Mark, can you tell us about our latest peer review uh, in Sweden? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Arno. In, indeed, I mean, the peer review is one of our sort of most popular services. It involves a two day uh, visit with experts uh, and we meet with your policymakers, your stakeholders, uh, and we work around a challenge that you've identified, a problem that you've identified. And on, the, on day two, we, we leave you with a, uh, a report, recommendations that we sometimes present to elected members. In Brandenburg, we recently we had the Secretary of State for European Affairs. Um, it's this wonderful brochure, which you can see, or maybe you can't see it next to me somewhere mm. there. You can download yes. it and you can find. Um, but as, as Arno said, we were in snowy Ustersund in, in mid-Sweden uh, last month, looking at how the value chain approach could help them uh, make the most of the unique uh, green energy resources that they have created over the years and uh, and how they, it's enabling them to attract interest from industrial investment for whether it's a, a battery plant, not yet, but uh, uh, excess and cheap energy is a clear uh, uh, locational factor, uh, giving them lots of interesting opportunities, but also challenges in terms of environmental impact and uh, faced with depopulation. So a number of different challenges, and we brought experts from across Europe but also help, help them engage with their neighboring regions in Sweden to see how maybe they could tackle these issues um, jointly. So uh, very interesting. And uh, Arno and I will be taking the Smarter Europe team into the Azores in, in January to look at another uh, um, peer review. So it's an easy uh, form to complete. It's you know four or five pages. It's an ongoing open call. There are no deadlines. And um, we're taking orders now for the spring. So uh, you know, don't, don't, don't wait too long. So um, look forward to seeing you um, submit some smart peer review requests to us. Yes, and it's very, very uh, simple, uh, easy process. Um, and we will be very happy if you want to do a peer review regarding policy experimentations, um, how to pilot uh, this type of experimentations and, and so on. And of course, we have the matchmaking, very easy process as well. Um, you send us a few words about your policy challenge, 
and it's like a mini match it's like a mini uh, peer review two hours online where we discuss um, your policy challenge and even you Jan in Switzerland you can use this service so it's one of the few uh, programs EU programs that you that you still have in, in Switzerland so you please um, take advantage of these um, opportunities. All right, what are we talking when we talk about policy experimentations? Of course, we have this uh, green and digital twin transition. So experimentations and experimenting with uh, new policies is, is great to, to promote uh, the, the, the digital and green transition. When we talk about policy experimentation, it is really about uh, testing new policies on a small scale. It's about measuring the impact and learning from the results to then scale up uh, successful solutions. And this approach is not widely used uh, in uh, research innovation policies in, in Europe, which is uh, not so good. So the European Commission, uh, Directorate General for Research and Innovation has launched um, the policy experimentation project. It's a very new, you can check the website, and it's to inform and integrate uh, policy experimentation into EU uh, research and innovation policy making. So why regions and municipalities are great for policy experimentations is that they really are, they are very agile and they and they possess the adaptability to tackle local issues, uh, but also to involve their, their communities. So making them ideal for driving uh, this type of policy experiments. Um, and of course, engaging in policy experimentation necessitates. Uh, risk taking uh, and the involvement of uh, some entrepreneurial minded entities and, and policy entrepreneurs. So it also involves some risk and some entrepreneurial uh, thinking. So now that we know uh, what uh, a policy experimentation is, uh, use uh, the link here on Slido um, to, to tell us a little bit more about um, a policy experimentation in new regions. So, Give us an example, but be very short uh, of, a, of a policy um, experimentation in your region. And maybe Mark, um, you can tell us uh, maybe an example of a policy experimentation yeah. in your region, in your region mm. too. Yeah, so I'm based uh, in the south of France between Marseille and Nice. And uh, within the smart specialization uh, strategy renewal process, and the subsequent economic strategy, they were looking to, uh, let's say, make some changes to the value chain approach, uh, and in particular, go for cross-sectorial collaboration. So we saw two interesting examples, one where um, three of the technology clusters that were involved with drones and the health sector uh, clusters, looking at how um, rural access and service access could be facilitated through drone experimentation in terms of meeting some of the regulations, the standard issues. So um, taking the drone technology from uh, military and civil security to into a new area. So they launched a call, they got um, potential um, entrepreneurship SMEs engaged and the clusters facilitated the testing of these facilities uh, for supporting new service delivery. So cross-sectorial was the policy experimentation. And then, um, as Arnaud mentioned, in, in the peer review uh, process, we sometimes get involved in preparing uh, documents for uh, uh, the renewal of strategies. And uh, we worked with the Région Sud um, on the theme of artificial intelligence and its role in uh, developing the health and the smart health, the personalized medicine services that the region could perhaps accelerate in terms of developing its smart specialization strategy and uh, in its economic strategy, uh, supporting some interesting initiatives in a sort of greater, uh, let's say, opening uh, towards public. Uh, the region around Sofia Antipolis um, recently held its week of I artificial intelligence so we can see how it filters down through all levels when you do policy experimentation it does raise awareness in other communities so um those are two examples from from the region sud and um we see some 
some start to Slido, so don't be shy. No, there's no wrong answer. So um, put some yes. Let's see the first one here. Uh, so I see three participants typing. Mm -hmm. And one participant say grants for SMEs, uh, contacting technology centers or mm -hmm. universities. Mm -hmm. So the type of innovation voucher, <coughs> right, mm -hmm. that we see where you can access to a small grant to, mm -hmm. um, to pilot um, specific initiatives, mm -hmm. uh, providing experts for knowledge transfer. Yes, that's good. Mm -hmm. And we did a pilot with a short training for SMEs on frugal mm -hmm. innovation, mm -hmm. a very novel um, concept for SMEs. Um, on, the, as a, on the first one, Arnaud, I think we can refer to the uh, peer review we did in Brandenburg at Potsdam, where the regional government wanted to indeed use uh, SME grants for promoting innovation, but in a cross-border context. Mm. And so we had uh, we had clusters and, and the managing authority from uh, regions in, in, in Western Poland come to the Brandenburg peer review to see how they could co-design uh, and, and accelerate the experimentation of cross-border innovation vouchers. Uh, that was uh, quite interesting. So these examples are all very relevant for, for you. Yes. And two more typing, some other more examples. Mm. Yes, do not be shy. Mm. And um, yes, so Frugal Innovation is an innovation method suitable for the peloton of SMEs. Mm. OK. That's good. Right. Maybe we should move on. Let's wait one more. <clears throat> Building ecosystem unbroken, medical technology and inclusion. So building a, an ecosystem for medical technology and inclusion. Well, Indeed, all good... social issues are, are a part of our new priorities, aren't they, Arnaud? We have a yes. broader scope now. So yes, do not hesitate to then f further this uh, policy experimentation with the uh, matchmaking of your reviews to discuss them. Mm -hmm. And we have experimented with innovation procurement. Yes, <clears throat> we wrote very nice um, policy brief on innovation mm -hmm. procurement as well. Mm -hmm. And many good practices from, from Inter Europe. There is this Inter Europe project from last programming period about uh, iBuy, the name of iBuy looking at innovation procurement. And acknowledging the market impact of public procurements and trying to use this as a strategic tool towards new and better solution. Yes, innovation procurement, great <laughs> tool mm. uh, to use to create new markets, but um, you know can be used strategically. And please have a look at our policy brief. Maybe Valentin, you can put in the, <clears throat> the 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 policy brief. Scale up training for startups who already tasted the innovation. Okay. All good examples. Thanks so much for participating on our short poll. Um, and of course, the policy learning platform can help. We have uh, many, many good practices. Um, as we mentioned, some of the good practices here that could be interesting for policy experimentation. There is the Gavli Innovation Arena, working kind of the Lugano um, Living Lab. So, so it's good to have you here, Jan. Also, Vitality Living Lab, looking at sports. Um, at the, at the local scale, we did peer reviews with Mark, um, for instance, like open innovation calls, like those type of challenge prices. And we did that with the region of Central Macedonia uh, last March. And as we mentioned, good policy briefs on innovation uh, procurement <coughs> and uh, regional ambitions. So please have a look at them and you can have the link in the chat. All right, but let's move on to our presentations. Now, uh, enough from, from us from the introduction. Um, Slavo, um, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Uh, please uh, share your presentation. And Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to giving me this privilege to present to you results of uh, uh, our research. Uh, let me just put it on a full screen. Um, yeah, I hope it's now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, this is the joint uh, paper written by me and uh, colleague uh, George Sekouras, who is actually now uh, back to Greece, and Peter Wosner from uh, Slovenia. 
and uh, it's a part of uh, first of all my activities as a uh, as a member of the scientific <laughs> committee of the GRC, which is thinking about the uh, new strategy for smart specialization. is very much concerned with the um, issues of uh, transformative innovation policy and the need uh, to introduce more experimentation innovation policy. Now you may ask yourself where that idea comes from. Uh, it comes from the fact that uh, um, a recognition that the government, as, as the policy principle, doesn't have all knowledge, doesn't under, uh, is not kind of uh, familiar with the specificities of specific uh, sectoral and technological areas. Uh, and therefore, uh, a policy where you have a, a government as a enlightened policymaker, which knows what should be done, is not really um, realistic. Therefore, uh, the, the the idea of the uh, experimentation and experimental governance comes into the almost into fashion today. Uh, so talking about that is easy, and there is a lot of that kind of rhetoric where everybody talks. Yeah, we should be experimenting, but on the other hand, I see there are two challenges to uh, really make it uh, uh, implementable. First is the challenge is the accountability because the public sector operates by its rules where you need uh, you know, a clear uh, responsibility for what money has gone and experimentation, let's not forget, always implies that there will be failures. How do you cope with that is something which um, we have um, explored in another paper and I will be happy to share with you that uh, paper and we even applied it in the context of, of uh, uh, Croatia. But I want to co focus today on the second issue, which is the issue of uh, institutionalization, which is the issue, how do you go about it uh, in a more kind of a, a practical uh, way? And uh, the current solution, which everybody, when people talk about the experimentation, oh, well, you will do pilots, you know, kind of. And that's why in uh, many developed countries, you have idea, oh, we will establish policy lab and then we will see what works and, and then we will work forward on that. And that, I would say, that is possible solution, but in a more complex uh, project where you have uh, lots of actors, uh, things which work in one region may not work in the other region because there are so many differences in the in a range of factors is just uh, too much and the we are the, the rationale for our paper is that the uh we don't have currently a satisfactory solution to the governance challenge when you have a transformative policies where you have numerous actors which are involved and uh, where experimentation is almost uh, inevitable but if you do pilots then uh, in, uh, uh, again, pilot in one context will not work in the other context. Uh, and also, if people are not part of the process, you know, there will be lots of resistance in that uh, context. Of course, there are two ways. One is the kind of uh, top down approach where uh, you basically start from, from this policy lab, from the pilot. The other is more uh, bottom up uh, process where you try to self organize these uh, uh, stakeholders. So, there are two kind of extremes. And we think that, uh, of course, uh, they are good for, for part of the story. It depends on the type of the problem, when you have a mission-oriented top-down and when you have a bottom-up. And we think that in most of the cases, you will have to look for some kind of intermediate solution. There will be a need for degree of directionality from, from the government, but at the same time, it doesn't go without the very much active involvement of uh, stakeholders. So the issue is here, how do you go about it? And this is where I, uh, you know, invited my my uh, uh, friends to to help me because uh, uh, this is not something which is a kind of uh, new actually in the in the European context because uh, uh, this is about basically network type of uh, programs uh, where practice has already generated relevant insight and lesson which we can use now in a context which seems to us new. So this is kind of we are discovering something which actually practice has already generated, but was not known. So what we have done, we simply uh, argue, we are not starting from the scratch. We simply have to build on the experiences, not many, but few experiences, which shows that you can introduce these uh, uh, elements of experimental innovation policy in the network type of programs. And in the paper, half of the paper is actually summary of the different uh, reports where we rely on uh, four types of programs. One is the uh, 
Slovenian case, which is the example of smart specialization strategy, which is a kind of semi-success story where we see elements of, of this uh, uh, issue that we are talking today. And uh, then we have uh, examples from Sweden, Netherlands, and Denmark, where these network type of programs uh, also have been uh, implemented. Of course, uh, I cannot now spend, um, I have only 10 minutes you know, to explain to detail each of these programs. So I really hope that you will look at the paper and see more uh, details uh, and specificities of this program, because you will see that uh, they're, of course, very different in their own ways. But what we are interested here, we are interested, what is that common denominator? Why? Because we think that all programs which are kind of on this middle level, which are engaged in the experimental type of policy, that they have these four, uh, these several features which we find in this uh, uh, type of uh, program which already uh, exist in uh, or have been implemented. So they are network uh, based uh, programs and they have several distinctive features. First is that uh, uh, these networks, they emerge driven by institutionally different facilitators. In each of these cases, there is a different facilitator. In one is the business platform, in other cases, a government. Uh, so you can, you can see that, but that is a crucial that you have to have a facilitator. And these facilitators, the crucial features that they're able to create a space for communication and interaction among stakeholders. Why? We aim to explore new options and solutions because nobody knows at the end what will be the, exactly the programs and projects that will be funded. You do it through this organized process, uh, uh, which is facilitated uh, through this uh, uh, facilitator, which again, organizationally is different in each of in individual uh, region. And these facilitators, they are not just passively there, they are engaged in brokering activities. It depends if it is, you know, individual firm, if it is network of companies, if it is range of uh, partners, which is universities, uh, research institutes, uh, a consultancy company with, with firms. And these activities of the uh, brokering activities are not confined to R&D. They are basically going into all elements which are needed for you to bring new product or processes to uh, a market. That is essential because we are here kind of uh, looking at it from the perspective of transformative innovation policy. Finally, these networking programs, they have to match support to individual needs. They are not kind of standardized, but they really come from the needs of the individual uh, organizations um, uh, companies, which means that also these needs are changing over time or during the process itself, through this process of, of discovering what is needed, then uh, there is a degree of flexibility in this uh, process, which is essential in all stages in the light of new uh, insight. The bottom line is why such programs are successful. They are successful if they manage to introduce this interaction among the uh, agents, each of whom is actually trying to solve his own problem, but together by committing themselves towards the same goal, uh, then they can achieve, they can move uh, things forward. Uh, of course, now I cannot give you kind of straightforward recipe. This is a kind of uh, uh, how conceptually you have to think about it and then see what is the institutional solution in your case, who is the facilitator, who is the broker, how do you organize it? But in all these cases, we see three uh, crucial stages. First is the learning, uh, your challenges in your region, which is kind of you have to do some homework. You know, it doesn't go out of the of the of the sky. So you have to uh, develop this first uh, stage. Uh, so through this active uh, brokering, then you are also identifying uh, who are the where are the synergies, where are complementarities between different. Uh, uh, stakeholders in this uh, uh, process. And on that basis, once you identify what are the commonalities, what are complementarities, then you are trying to shape uh, uh, specific um, programs, types of grants, type of support which is needed. So you will have kind of this uh, loop, uh, uh, continuous active process. But that doesn't go without something which is relatively new. And what is relatively new is the idea that this is not simply a sitting talking club, but this is a kind of process which uh, follows the methodology, which is quite developed in business sector, which is the methodology of action learning. And uh, what is our novelty here? We think that it is a time is ripe to transfer some of the uh, positive experiences in business sector to a policy area. And action learning is such a methodology. And one of our authors is actually has been actively involved in uh, many projects uh, funded by the EU in the um, development of this uh, learning network, 
which are actually formal arrangements with explicit operational uh, structure. And when we have a kind of uh, designated role in this uh, uh, process where you um, organize this, uh, you don't have to call it learning network. This is simply a generic uh, name, but you try to facilitate learning through this process where you include all stakeholders. The value is in that case that they basically you, through the rules uh, of, of the learning network, you then also try to reduce the power of, of hierarchy in, in the sense that, you know, if somebody is a higher in a hierarchy, it has a bigger role in this or, or deciding what will happen. So you uh, create a more horizontal structure where you have a, a clear and well, well defined and kind of uh, roles and you have a primary uh, target, which is a kind of uh, trying to find uh, joint solutions to, to problems of each of the uh, stakeholders. And uh, <clears throat> I could go, uh, I could say more, but I think one of the participants in this uh, uh, meeting today is also one of my uh, co-authors who, who can say more because I, I see the time already out of time. So in a conclusion, uh, the main message is that we think that the pilots and policy labs are, are valuable, but they are limited solution in the context of where we have a more complicated structure with more uh, stakeholders, that uh, if we want to think about the partnership for regional innovation, then we have to think about it in a, a, a based on the experience of network-based uh, programs, uh, and that this process has to be institutionally uh, organized, of course. In countries where the institutional environment is called thicker, it will be easier. In countries where uh, institutional environment is weaker, and our example is Slovenia, which is actually relatively on the top of, of the of, of the Eastern Europe, uh, then there ha would have to be stronger role of the government. And of course, the crucial thing is how do you uh, ensure that it doesn't break because of the politics? You know, how do you ensure kind of stability of that, which is outside of, of the daily policy? So that's in a nutshell. I know it was maybe not everything clear, but I hope you will look at the paper and I'm happy to have discussion later on. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Slavo, for your presentation. You can find the, the link uh, in the chat for, for the report. Uh, Mark, do, do you have any question? Yeah, thanks, Slavo. I think uh, you know, we always give the, the speakers a horrendous challenge uh, to condense a lot of knowledge. So I appreciate your, uh, your slides and your efforts to do that. Um, to the audience, I think, you know, you've got a, a resource through uh, this document uh, that we've just shared and also asking questions if you want to uh, do so. I've got two quick ones for you. Um, I think, you know, it's good to have the summary methodological and uh, key uh, policy um, terms that can help others uh, learn from them. The question I was thinking along the, uh, to ask you is the the process of raising expectations uh, through the engagement, uh, the different forms of, you know, you mentioned learning networks, but generally when you engage in this policy experimentation, to what extent are the expectations uh, heightened and then therefore implementation almost obligatory? Or, or is there a sort of linear flow you can say, yes, it does deliver and we do actually implement, or do we remain at a policy experimentation? So, well, that was a nice learning experience, but not actually putting it into implementation. Do you have any feedback, Slavo, on that issue? Well, in this case, uh, um, you cannot uh, determine what will be the final outcome. You may have a vague ideas, but that's the whole point why it is called experimentation. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, the, the the so you have to have a flexibility, but the the uh, uh, as long as uh, your stakeholders are engaged in the process. That means that they find their own interest, you know, and the experience from these learning networks, uh, you have, a, you know, in, in, in businesses, you have a, in regions where companies meet, let's say, once a month and, and they keep coming because they find it useful. So uh, basically your uh, success is determined as long as people stay in, into the game. That means mm -hmm. that they find it uh, useful. And of yep. course, you if you progress through these stages from uh, exploring the, the, the challenges, then mm -hmm. finding what are the individual issues and how you uh, find complementarities between mm -hmm. them, then you are on the right uh, route. So, but uh, again, the point is, um, this is a type of experimentation where you don't do pilot and then you said, oh, we know what it is and now we will spread around it. We think that this is possible innovation area for limited type of intervention. You can do it for innovation vouchers, fine, no problem. But if you are really talking about the more complex multi-stakeholder 
programs, then I think you have to think uh, the the main issue is then how do you upscale it? Yeah. Because people uh, will not buy it that. simply. Mm -hmm. you, know. you mentioned the need for avoiding sort of policy silo, you know, needing the, the collaboration yes. between different policy directions. Oh, last question um, before Arnold moves the uh, agenda on is to what extent um, have some of the examples looked at the inter-regional or, or cross-border uh, process? Because, you know, I can't be in an interreg Europe event without looking at this uh, inter-regional uh, challenge or learning network process. Any uh, insights from you? Unfortunately, we haven't found uh, when we were working on these of uh, really uh, cases which will be inter-regional. Mm. So, which means that the program that the problem then becomes slightly bigger because mm. if you have to form these kind of learning networks, mm. if they have to be interregional, mm. which means that uh, your uh, scale becomes different. Maybe in mm. some cases it may be easier. It depends of, mm. of how you define mm. it. But unfortunately, you know, kind of this is a a, a new type of a challenge, which is obviously mm. very much kind of institutional, organizational. Mm. But as long as you ensure these uh, uh, facilitators, broker, as long as they understand both regions, as long mm. as you agree who is in that network, who is the moderator, who mm. are the group facilitators, mm. what are the members, you invite experts, mm. then there is no reason yeah. why that cannot mm. work. But so far, I cannot come and say, look, this is how it works. Yeah. I think in one of the challenge um, workshops, Nahno mentioned, we, we saw how on issues such as mobility, uh, you could actually tackle it with some digital tools that work to, you know, cross border, whether it's bus passes, whether it's car parking, whether it is, et cetera. So probably some thematics are better suited. Uh, I appreciate that. It's also complementarity among the organizations. They really have to be interested and uh, mm. complementary with complementary activities in another region. I mean, mm. otherwise it can be all just uh, one game without really moving things on the ground. Mm. Mm. So that's the... Okay. All right. Thanks. Sir. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks Lavo. Um, stay with us for the structured discussion. Thanks so much for your presentation. You mentioned in your presentation, well, um, experimentations uh, involve also a little bit of risk uh, taking, a uh, lot of courage, and also accept the, the risk for failure. And this is great because we have with us uh, Jan and Lugano. You've been also experimenting with some controversial innovation like blockchain and Bitcoin. So. Uh, Jan, um, the floor is yours, and you have uh, you have ten minutes. Perfect. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to everyone. And hello from uh, Ticino, Lugano, Switzerland. Let me share my screen. All right. So uh, in the ten minutes that I have, I will try to share uh, the better I, I could the story of uh, Lugano Living Lab, who can be seen as a tentative of an institution uh, to unlock uh, uh, innovation uh, processes and, uh, and projects. Of course, uh, what I will present is not to be an, uh, seen as a magic formula, eh? but it works, uh, I hope, really well uh, in the context of uh, our city, uh, Lugano. So um, first of all, Lugano Living Lab. So we are uh, at the urban lab uh, of the city of Lugano. Our mission is to promote and facilitate digital and technological innovation in the city and for the city. We have been uh, created in 2019 uh, as an instrument to basically execute uh, the uh, new city roadmap or strategy that has been launched in 2018. In 2018, Lugano uh, put out a very um, ambitious strategy to become one of the European hub for digital innovation and uh, become a testbed for emerging technologies. And Lugano Living Lab has been the consequences uh, of, that, uh, of that strategy. Uh, personally, I joined the team in 2020 when the team uh, has been formed. It's uh, a team of four resources with different backgrounds from economics to AI. Uh, we have a postdoc as well that is more rooted in the university um, team. And uh, uh, on our organizational side, we are based 
and uh, in, within the city administration. So we are 100% part of the city administrations and we are directly attached to the secretary of the municipality, of the municipality meaning we have a direct access uh, to decision making. And, and this is very, very important uh, on, on the way we are, we are working. So next one, sorry, perfect. Um, what we are basically doing uh, on a daily basis is that we are trying to develop new digital solutions, uh, playing with these three main emerging technologies. So currently we do have projects uh, using IoT technology, AI, and uh, as Arno said, uh, we have a, quite some uh, important project also around the blockchain technologies, experimenting with, uh, with, with blockchain with different sense. And uh, we play uh, in these three main areas, innovation uh, for smart city solutions. Uh, we do a lot when it comes to creating digital awareness in our regions, in our city. So we do uh, a lot of events and workshops around digital education for all the different stakeholders involved. And we do, of course, experimentation and applied research uh, with the, the university uh, in Lugano and uh, outside Lugano, offering basically Lugano as a testing ground uh, for testing new uh, solutions and technology. Uh, we, uh, as a uh, living lab, we have uh, built a network of uh, more than 40 uh, companies that are part of the Lugano Living Lab network. Uh, these uh, companies and institutions goes from uh, the three local universities, uh, startups working in the Web3 sphere, uh, the railway Swiss companies, the telecommunication company. Uh, so we have the tourism organization, IBM. So we try to have uh, all the different economic uh, uh, sectors represented so that we can outsource uh, also the knowledge, the vertical knowledge, according to the different project that has been managed. Um, what is a living lab? So uh, Slavo before um, uh, was uh, talking also about the topic of uh, uh, who is taking the architect, who is the facilitator, right? So in our living lab, the institutions, the municipality is the facilitator. Uh, so we are in the middle of these ecosystems and we try to orchestrate uh, and uh, um, between the different stakeholders, public actors, private actors, knowledge institutes, and of course the users. So the goals of a living lab and what a living lab stands for is to do a real life uh, experimentation in a user-centric environment and trying to iterate uh, solutions by working very closely uh, with the, the citizens and the end users uh, of the services. Uh, why Lugano? Uh, we believe that Lugano uh, have, has the right characteristic to be uh, a real life living lab. First of all, we have a population of 67,000 inhabitants. So we are quite a relatively small cities, although we are the biggest city in the southern part of Switzerland. We have placed in a strategic uh, location, so not only we have uh, more than 2,000 hours of sunshine per year, that doesn't matter where, we are placed between two big uh, metropolitan areas, Zurich and, uh, and Milan, very well connected. We have a vibrant business ecosystem uh, with a lot of the companies, not only in the financial space, but also pharmaceutical space and Web3 uh, space as well. And uh, being a very small city, we do have more than three local universities, plus some very important and recognized knowledge institutes like the Instituto dalle Molle for uh, study in intelligence artificiale, so for in, uh, artificial intelligence studies or the computational uh, center uh, also based in, uh, in Lugano. So we have the right uh, characteristic to try uh, to build uh, a network that can unlock uh, innovation uh, project and, uh, and solution. Uh, now, with the time that I have, I want to go uh, a little bit deeper in some of the in some of the projects that we have been uh, carrying out. And um, the first one being My Lugano. Uh, this this project was launched 
during the pandemic uh, at the beginning of 2020. And is a project, uh, is, a, is a small living lab, if you want to see like that, uh, experimenting with digital payment using a local payment token, uh, trying to create a solution that supports a local uh, business owner in Lugano. So we have created a local payment token running on a blockchain uh, that basically rewards people that are uh, buying and selling in the city. By buying uh, in the city using this token, you are collecting uh, more of this uh, local token that you can then spend again uh, within the uh, local economic sector. So it's a policy uh, of the government to um, um, promote uh, economic development in the region. The project has been awarded this year with the first place of the EEE Smart City Awards. So we have won the first, uh, the first prize and uh, is a really um, um, a project transforming and promoting digitalization uh, throughout the city, working closely with local businesses, universities, and of course, the citizens. We have more than 400 affiliated shops nowadays that are accepting and doing daily transactions with these tokens. We have more than 30,000 users with a population of 67,000. So almost half of the population is part of this uh, uh, service is of course we are beyond uh, what we call a pilot so the first year was of course a piloting now it's a, a real uh, services uh, that the city is providing uh, to the uh, local businesses and the, the population another project uh, um, involving the usage of blockchain technology has been the launch of 3a chain 3a chain is a local blockchain technology that the city has been promoted together with local partners. And uh, here the idea was to enable local uh, businesses and, and companies uh, to use and leverage these emerging technologies in order to build new applications. So nowadays we have more than 30 partners in this project. You can imagine is a network and every partner is participating uh, to this network by hosting a nodes of this technology. So these technologies has more than 30 computers, big computers, if you want to see it like that, spread it out in Lugano. All the companies that are, that are part are um, providing computational powers, contributing to running these infrastructures. This infrastructure is powering applications like the MyLugano one you have seen. So we have more than 8,000 uh, transactions validated by these technologies on a monthly basis only for the Luga. So only for the, the local token, plus uh, additional applications that are uh, built, launched, and developed by uh, our partners uh, uh, participating to this, uh, to this project. Uh, we have a big project. Uh, uh, this is a joint venture between the city and some private partners called Lugano Plan Bs. You may have uh, um, heard something about it. That this is a very uh, broad uh, project trying to uh, promote the usage and the education of uh, Web3 and uh, technologies uh, like Bitcoin and blockchain throughout, uh, throughout the city. So we are, for example, enabling local merchants to receive uh, payment uh, with, uh, with cryptos. We have developed our own solution to do that. Uh, we are organizing uh, uh, educational events. We are partnering with the local universities to create new education programs on this technology with the goal of transforming Lugano in the European hub uh, for, um, this, uh, for this technology. Of course, um, we are not vertical only on the Web3 and, and blockchain. Uh, almost half of our projects are related to promote uh, digital access and digital awareness for everyone. We have uh, uh, running projects and, and pilots dealing, for example, with the uh, challenge of the um, digital divides. We have, for example, created a digital help point uh, throughout Lugano, so physical point where people can go and receive support on the daily task they need to perform uh, with a digital platform, for example. We have projects dealing with digital circularity. We have one very nice project called Equid, 
that is reusing uh, computers that are, are dismantled by uh, local companies. We are fixing them and uh, um, then uh, giving them uh, for free for people in needs. Uh, we are playing a lot and collaborating also uh, in the realm of uh, urban arts, trying to uh, create uh, new connections between technology, arts, uh, communications. And as I said, we are organizing hundreds uh, of events and participating in hundreds of, of events around uh, the topic of uh, uh, digital uh, awareness, digital inclusions, uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Everything we try to do uh, is digital first and not digital only, meaning we really care uh, about the inclusions and we try to make people and all the population parts of what we are doing by creating uh, an educational uh, opportunity for, uh, for everyone. Just the last one, uh, it's a, only one an example of many projects we are doing is the third uh, pillars, if you want, of Lugan Living Lab activities, uh, the uh, applied research. So we are part of uh, uh, many um, research projects. This one is a very a big one called DG Cities is a project that will uh, started last year will uh, last for eight years, uh, and again we are implementation partner of this uh, project, meaning the technology that will be developed. Uh, it's SIA, so Istituto dalle Molle is part as well of this project and is based in Lugano. The solutions that will be developed and studied will be tested uh, in Lugano first uh, as one of the first. Uh, uh, testing that, and this is thanks, of course, of uh, our role of facilitator within this uh, uh, innovation um, ecosystem. Um, okay, I, I run very, very fast. I hope uh, uh, I stayed within my 10 minutes. Um, we have a website, of course, www.luganolivinglab.ch. Uh, you will have a full overview of uh, our projects, our upcoming events, our research project, and of course, uh, feel free to ask questions or uh, also to get in touch after this presentation if you want uh, to learn more about uh, uh, what we are doing here in, uh, in Lugano. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Jan. That was a fascinating presentation and what you're doing in Lugano is very interesting. And we received two uh, questions that we will do later for everyone that relates very well with what you're doing. So how to justify spending public money for experimentations and, and how to convince uh, politicians or politicians can, um, can demonstrate that experimentation is good. So we will ask everyone at the, at the, during the structured discussion. Mark, do you have any, any question for you? Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I think Congratulations, Janet. I think one of the things that stands out from this uh, project is the diversity of issues you were able to tackle. You know, as we know, uh, digital and green transitions are driving change. But I think you've demonstrated that at a, a city level. I've got two questions. I mean, many people will have living lab of similar uh, structures in, in their cities or, or regions. And you've got a really interesting partnership of public and, and strong private. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's quite unique. You don't always see that. Uh, what, how does the sort of project pipeline uh, function? I mean, it's because you, you know with the broad you know topics, all of the members come forward and say, "I've got one on energy. I've got one on digital divide. Um, you're helping the aged uh, access." How, how do you sort of um, prioritize? Perhaps would be the simple way of asking the question. Yeah. Uh, great, great questions, uh, Mark. So we, um, of course, our uh, North Star is the uh, city roadmap that was uh, mm. uh, defined in 2018, as I said. So in, in this strategy, we have basically the big action point and the big results that we that we want to that we want to achieve. Mm. Uh, then uh, the trigger, uh, as I said, it was in 2000 end of 2019, beginning of 2020, when we launched this My Lugano project <coughs> that, that was really, really, really well received and uh, was really, at the time, was really um, uh, dis disruptive as a project. It was, I believe, the first uh, institutions or municipality in the world 
or one of the first that was uh, leveraging blockchain technology to try to create uh, something new and support the local economy. So we drive also the attention of many, many players uh, in, the, in the sphere that are now reaching out to us, asking to collaborate because uh, they have the technology, but they do not have the use case. So they now see Lugano as a, uh, they, first of all, they have people that are speaking their language, which is not always the case uh, mm -hmm. when these private companies are approaching the municipality. Uh, we have the mindset as well within uh, the city, at the, at the very top level the of level. the policy, mm -hmm. policy making mm -hmm. uh, people and uh, the administrations. Mm -hmm. And we have the structure as well uh, in order to collaborate with them. As I said, I think this is what really stands for because Living Lab, as you said, you will see a lot of example, right? Mm -hmm. And many, many times they are rooted within the academics. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our case, I think what is special is that we are more rooted in the administrations. We are like a um, innovation department of a private company or a, or a small startups mm -hmm. working within the, the city administrations. Mm -hmm. Having a small team of only four people as is, uh, with a direct contact with the, uh, the municipal secretary and ultimately with the major, mm -hmm. help us uh, to mm -hmm. uh, bring forward all mm -hmm. these initiatives in a very, uh, in a very agile way. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, within all the municipal, Lugano has more than thousands uh, collaborators. People dealing with these uh, innovation projects, I would say are five to six. Mm. And with five to six and a network of partner, of course, we are mm. able to do all of this stuff. Mm. So I think, again, it's not a matter of having a lot of resources. Mm. It's a matter of having the right resources and the mm. right structure mm. in order to make things happen at the end. Mm. Okay. Well, thanks for that comprehensive response. Uh, Ulrich Schenker has, has kindly asked a question uh, on, on the chat, so thank you. Uh, Jan, uh, he, he, you can read it as well as I, but I'll summarize it. He's looking at how maybe some of the uh, elements in society that are less familiar with uh, digital tools, the elderly or people who don't have access through social uh, exclusion uh, issues. How, how do they um, get mapped into your city roadmap of priorities, perhaps? It's, uh, as, I, as I said, is, uh, is our priority <clears throat> is to create digital inclusiveness. Uh, but we are not scared to play with the emerging technology. So one example, I think, uh, uh, that really stands for, we, we, do have, we have developed our uh, digital payment wallet, as I said, that is using blockchain and a payment token. And uh, we have uh, uh, more than 30% of the users that are 60 plus. So, of mm. course, we do have a very... Mm a very old overall populations. Our average user using these solutions as 44 years old, mm -hmm. meaning we are succeeding <clears throat> of uh, uh, enabling uh, all the populations to use and leverage mm -hmm. these tools. Uh, many, many times what we are trying to do is, first of all, offering supports in many ways. So not only digital supports, but physical supports. So we have a lot of people that are still in needs to go in some place, like the digital help point, and meet somebody. Mm -hmm. And we do offer that. We offer supports online. Mm -hmm. Of course, we, we offer a lot of events, training, and education workshops that people are attending as well mm -hmm. in order to better understand. And then we offer digital and analogic solutions for everything we are doing. Again. We do offer the possibility to manage your payment wallet, for example, mm. on the, 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 the digital device. The but we also it. develop <clears throat> a physical card that you are still able to use in, in case you are still preferring. And this right. is very, very important. It requires mm. additional effort mm. on our side, mm. but it's an effort that we are, of course, mm. willing to do in mm. order yeah. to maintain. Well, thanks for those first insights. I think uh, you've answered and given those options, as you said, for people who are maybe less uh, at ease with the digital. Um, people have asked a question by Johan uh, Diaz. You'll see in the questions and the answer section, you can perhaps type your response because uh, uh, we're going to move on the agenda. So thank you to Johan Diaz for asking the question. I I'm sure Jan will have a comprehensive answer to share with you uh, but yeah use the chat and the q a uh, on our platform 
for giving some feedback. So, Arno, let's thank you very much. Up. Thanks, Ian, for your presentation. Stay with us for the discussion. And we move on, we move to uh, Italy, to Turin, beautiful city of Turin. Uh, Claudia, the, the floor is yours, and you have 10 minutes. Yes, thank you, Arno, and uh, uh, Claudia from Metropolitan City of Turin. Thank you for this opportunity. Let's share my presentation. You do you see my presentation? Yeah. Yes, it's good. Okay. So thank you very much for for this opportunity. It's very very interesting to to learn to hear about uh, other experiences. Uh, my presentation is concentrated to a. Um, a a, a good practice uh, around uh, the the issue uh, linked to social uh, innovation. Uh, so uh, I think okay. <laughs> so. Uh, we are a metropolitan city located in the northwest of Italy. Uh, we are we are quite a big uh, uh, metropolitan city, uh, the biggest at the national level, but also one of the biggest in uh, in Europe, because uh, we are composed of three hundred three hundred and twelve municipalities. Uh, with Turin at the center, let's say, and uh, other uh, uh, small or very small municipalities uh, around uh, around uh, Torino, and in uh, in um, rural or mountain territory. Um, we are uh, we have a very very. Uh, interesting uh, entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem, but it, it is uh, the, the problem. It is that uh, it, it is very rich, but also very fragmented, and the dimension of, of uh, our businesses is uh, very very uh, micro. So, uh, coming to the social innovation uh, topic, uh, I. I present very, very briefly our experience in social, in Torino Social Impact, that is an, an initiative uh, that is uh, run mainly by uh, the municipality of Turin, and the main investors are the, the municipality, but the local chamber of commerce and some uh, bank foundation. So uh, now uh, more than uh, 218 actors joined the platform and they signed, and also us, we signed a memorandum of understanding. It means that, uh, the, that there is a, a very, very soft engagement in this kind of uh, experimentation. And uh, the engagement is to share with this uh, platform, with these stakeholders, uh, all our initiatives uh, linked with uh, the social innovation uh, topic. Um, the definition uh, of uh, the impact is based uh, on three principles, the intentionality, the additionality and the, the measurability of the uh, action. So uh, the, the, the process, uh, the path starts in uh, 2012 and uh, the uh, project, uh, this project start, uh, the, 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 the first step uh, starting from the My Generation at Work project and uh, put uh, together in 2017 uh, the, the, the first launch, so a uh, fitting organization uh, inside. Then they defined a strategic plan and uh, trying to uh, draw the governance system. And uh, uh, in 2023, there was the launch of the um, Borsa dell'Impatto Sociale, that means a sort of uh, um, stock exchange 
change of the uh, social impact. Uh, and then every year they draw, uh, they define, they, I mean, the city with the Chamber of Commerce and the Bank Foundation, they uh, define the, uh, the main strategic uh, steps and they uh, share uh, with the, all the stakeholders and collect inputs uh, uh, to, uh, to go on. Inside uh, this uh, experience uh, uh, of our territory, uh, we try to uh, invest directly our direct resources into uh, this initiative that is called Inno Social Metro. Uh, that uh, the, the, the aim is try to uh, to push, to promote the involvement of the micro enterprises of our territory around the concept of so social innovation. Because uh, you can imagine that uh, the, the biggest things, the biggest dynamics are concentrated on the urban center, on Torino city. No? And uh, um, seeing our structure, the structure of our ter ter territory is difficult to, uh, to uh, spread the concept and to promote uh, also the, this kind of dynamics in, uh, in a territory uh, uh, where the municipalities are small and uh, uh, not so densely populated. So uh, we launched the, uh, the, this year this, uh, this kind of activity and uh, the, uh, our target are the micro and small enterprises um, that are interested and want to develop their uh, business model towards the concept of social innovation. Here you can find some, some uh, numbers and some um, and some definition uh, in few words uh, we uh, we uh, choose to uh, to 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 be a, pro a program uh, composed by two two elements sorry two elements uh, a financial support but also an individual training for the enterprises willing to develop a social innovation uh, project. So uh, we selected 14 experts that will provide uh, train and uh, skills uh, um, to, to develop this, this project to the final, uh, final beneficiaries. And, uh, and then uh, they, they develop with this implementing uh, subject that are experts, uh, they, um, they, they project. And then if this project is validated, they can uh, gain access to the financial support instrument that it is uh, composed by a, a fund and a, a financial, uh, um, a, a bank uh, loan. So uh, this uh, policy, a lifespan of three years, and uh, as a, we, we foresee to have uh, to reach uh, triple goal that, uh, that that are having supported the implementation of innovative projects with a positive impact on the society, with uh, with a, a, a broad uh, approach, society uh, on the society, on the environment, on the labor, and and so on. Uh, having raised the level of social economy literacy of our entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, with a, an attention to the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, that are located more uh, on the remote area of our territory and having learned more about the social economy in our territory. It is not easy to 
uh, really understand or have a common concept of social uh, innovation. And so we ask to, uh, to this accompanying uh, um, subject to focus on the measurability <laughs> of the impact. Also in order to obtain project and people and businesses uh, capable to access other funds that uh, that are uh, that, that are at disposal for this kind of uh, of innovation uh, pathways uh, out of our in you know, social metro uh, program so uh, i hope to uh, to have been able to give you some uh, some um, not answer but maybe some inspiration <laughs> And uh, I'm uh, I'm at your disposal today, but uh, also afterwards uh, uh, to to discuss and, and to go in uh, uh, deeper in this uh, in this uh, um, to, to explain to share with you what uh, what Excellent. we are dealing here in Turing on these topics. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Claudia, for your presentation. Um, that was super interesting, Mark. Any yeah. any questions? Yes. Thanks again, Claudia. I think. Very complementary to the other presentations as well. It, it gets into the, the concrete, uh, you know, the scope of implementation. Uh, and as Adnall said in the introduction, you know, when we work with a policy learning platform, we always try and find good practices to to illustrate. And it means you, as the audience, uh, can also access and you know, interrogate the, the good practice database. And then you won't have Claudia there to answer directly, but uh, you'll find some information. Um, I just wanted to, uh, one question of clarification um, that the, the um, grants that companies get, um, do they, you, I saw uh, you mentioned 50% match funding. So do they have to, uh, you basically fund half the project that they wish to implement, is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. Okay, and it's not a sort of a, uh, reimbursable it is you know a grant and that's it yeah yes it's, it's a, a grant and uh and up uh, they they can choose the two solution it's not mm. compulsory to have uh, both the, mm. the, the loan mm. and the grant you can mm. uh, they can choose mm. uh, but the, the, there is a part of grant mm. that mm. they have not to reimburse and mm -hmm. a part of loan with the bank system mm. okay and I'm sure it's, it's a, a, a question many of our participants would be asking themselves is when you create such a platform uh, with a memorandum of understanding, et cetera, there is a cost of, of managing, a cost of animating. Uh, are, are those costs all borne by the uh, Torino Metropolitan City Government? Uh, no, uh, the, the, this platform is mm. uh, has been launched and promoted by the city of Turin, mm -hmm. not not by the metropolitan. We are there, okay. mm -hmm. and we uh, from from the very starting point. Mm. And uh, as far as I know, the cost the the, the, the cost of the launch was uh, was supported uh, by. Th there are three main. Uh, investors in mm. this uh, in, in this uh, experience, mm. the city of Turin, mm. but uh, um, the, the, the the two main <laughs> investors are the Chamber of Commerce and the Bank Foundation. Okay. So mm. the the city is guaranteeing mm. the uh, maintenance, the people that. Mm. Uh, and they offer a free uh, entrance for mm. all the people that want to uh, put content, uh, mm. publish news, mm. and uh, mm. so I, I have my my password. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are there as mm. Metropolitan City. I have my I gain my password for free, mm. and I can push uh, and I can uh, publish uh, uh, news uh, stories uh, and uh, content and information and some. One of the inside the the city of Turin uh, mm -hmm. is uh, um, only they they make a check uh, and then maintain uh, the, the 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 platform uh, uh, inside the municipality. Mm -hmm. uh, our uh, we we want uh, our policymakers <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, want to try to uh, promote this system that that are. 
mainly concentrated at urban level because it's mm. it's natural. There is a, a natural concentration mm. uh, is, uh, of uh, funds. Uh, they they try to spread throughout all the, our territory. Mm. That is really fragmented. Mm. This kind of concept and this kind of collaboration. Mm. I think it's, it's an interesting example for others to have a look at. Okay. Um, All right. I see we can move to the panel now, Arnaud. Yes, let's uh, let's move to the panel discussion. Uh, so please turn on your camera, yeah, so we can see um, each other. Mm. And maybe we we start with the, the question that I was asked in the chat from <laughs> Masha and Ulrich. Mm. Um, so how to justify public spending for experimenting with uh, public policies, uh, mm -hmm. treating like citizen as the test uh, people, mm -hmm. you know, like experimenting with policy can fail, uh, they are risky, so it takes a lot of courage. So <clears throat> how to justify this public uh, spending for experimenting with policies? Slavo, do you have any any insights, any ideas how to justify experiment experimentations? You muted, you muted, you need to. Yeah. Sorry, now we come to the crucial issue of um, accountability, which I mentioned before. And I, uh, we've been thinking about that uh, a lot in terms of uh, trying to reconcile it, because uh, uh, there is this huge gap between uh, <coughs> rhetoric of uh, a public policy, uh, which is for experimentation, and then accountability. So the, the issue is... Uh, that basically there are two types of accountability. One is the accountability for the outcome, but the other one is accountability for the process. And I think um, crucial is to introduce also this accountability for the process. If you think about the learning networks, then you have to accept that in experimentation, there will be failures. But as long as you show that there is a, um, accountability regarding the process and that there are some lessons from that process, then you sort of, so to say, cover yourself. Because otherwise, uh, thinking in a conventional way just about the accountability of outcome, nobody will do anything in that case. We know how it goes, you know, kind of. Then you have this uh, logic, uh, every euro given must be returned and justified. But in this case, if you introduce accountability of the process itself, uh, uh, then uh, in overall, you know, you know that your experimentation will give positive outcome. It doesn't mean that each individual case, but in, but then you can justify it always with the uh, process, uh, with the due uh, diligence process, and and how what is the quality of that process, and what were the lessons from uh, from the failure, and and what are the you know uh, then uh, what follows from that. So that's the in a nutshell mm -hmm. how pu conventional public policy has to go about it. Yes, thanks so much, Lavo. There is a follow-up question in the chat for you from Beata. Uh, would you say that accountability rather than responsibility should be emphasized? That the accountability then the responsibility. Yes, versus uh, responsibility. Um, well, uh, I would like to think more about this difference between accountability and responsibility. I, I don't understand fully what's the actually huge, uh, what's the difference between these two, because if I'm accountable, then by definition, I am responsible. So to say, um, crucial is to um, ensure what are the, the, the clarity of, of, of the rules in that case and, and mm -hmm. uh, responsibility uh, of each of the players for a specific role in the process. So then, because... These are not individuals, you know, th this is the network type of program like where each uh, of the stakeholders has responsibility for its own role. So in that case, uh, mm. they are kind of, res they have to be responsible for that role. But in, in overall, then the, you, you have a kind of accountability if each of them is individually responsible. So that's how I see it. But uh, it's an interesting mm. point. I, I would have to think more about it. It's just... mm. Yes. Oh. How about our other two speakers? Do you have any, uh, uh, you know, experience or, of this issue yes. of? Uh... Yeah, Jan, you've been experimenting with the controversial innovations, blockchain, Bitcoin. So, how to justify this public spending for for experimenting with public policies? The, the, the best things is to showing results of what you are doing. So, 
Uh, we have a, a, a well a presence in the city. Uh, it's very concrete, so everybody can see what we are doing. Everybody can be part of what we are doing. Uh, uh, and I think this is the best, the best things, uh, showing what we are doing on the exterior part, so the citizen part, but also uh, to the colleagues working within the administrations and uh, ultimately the, the municipal as well that are working. They, everybody can see and, uh, and, and measure as well. Uh, the, what the, the, are the results of the actions mm. uh, we are we are doing? Mm. So I think this is mm. the best. Uh, this is this is mm. the best things you can do. Mm. Thank you. I, yeah. I think all, all all three speakers you've also highlighted mm. how a partnership approach uh, does not de-risk, but it certainly allows a policymaker to uh, approach uh, societal challenge or a you know a social inclusion challenge in a different way. So a partnership can be a way of, you know, having this accountability and responsibility shared and and more transparent. Yes. If I if I can add maybe something to that, what is a critical novelty of network type of programs mm. is the that you don't have a hierarchy, that mm. you know in partnership you have to be accountable to each other, yeah, mm. because in a normal public. Uh, um, you know, sector, you have a vertical accountability. Mm. You have your boss and, and you're responsible <laughs> to them. You know, kind of. But the network program is qualitatively different situation. How I ensure that you're accountable to me and I, that I'm accountable to you. So that is the, the novelty which uh, uh, to which uh, a conventional public sector is, uh, is not still adjusted, so to say. But that's mm. why this issue of the process and the process accountability is, is a crucial. Yes. So it's the horizontal accountabilities, I would say, this is the crucial novelty of all network type of programs. Thanks, Lavo. Um, Claudia, yeah, would... we have seen accountability for the process, being very concrete in what we do, um, and partnership and accountability for each other. Do you have any further insights? Yeah, I would add uh, uh, on the advantages of uh, partners with uh, external player. Uh, three main things, possibility to get access to additional funds as well. So for example, in the city of Lugano, currently we are one of the only uh, teams that is bringing funds in. <laughs> uh, so we have a positive, almost a positive balance, which is of course uh, uh, very important uh, as well. Uh, point number two that I would say, uh, get access to uh, knowledge that you cannot find inside the city administration. Think about emerging technology. So it's very difficult for a municipality uh, to, to have uh, resources that have vertical knowledge in the AI or in the blockchain or in the machine learning, right? We have uh, an IT department that is maintaining and running the existing infrastructures. Uh, so uh, how, and this is probably not the right team to uh, uh, experiment with new technologies, right? So you need to outsource these uh, uh, resources and skill outside. And point number three, which is fundamental, I believe, uh, if you want to experiment in the digital world, is time to market, right? So when you are mm -hmm. going and and uh, partnering with uh, private partners, for example, you can have a faster time to market. You can yeah, iterate faster uh, your solutions uh, yes. as well, which is uh, yes. which is crucial. Right. Uh, three excellent points. Claudia, any further insights on this? Uh, um, uh, some some thoughts uh, about uh, about the the cooperation and uh, the uh, how we decide and I will be uh, in a measure to to to. To, to measure the impact of this uh, of, of this initiative, so uh, we we took uh, more than six months <laughs> to share this idea with our ecosystem. That I repeat, mainly based in the core center uh, of our region, and uh, because uh, there are a, a lot of very skilled people and very skilled subject uh, on uh, and experience on this topic on our on our province, 
And so we try to define a structure, a very uh, a structure trying to target, uh, to, to identify that to target uh, the area that was not already engaged. Uh, and we share the process uh, and the technicalities of uh, our program with uh, the, the more experienced uh, uh, subject in this area. And uh, I think that uh, at the end of the day, what will be uh, the, 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 we, what will really uh, tell us if it is a success or not will be the number of uh, micro and small enterprises that finally will ask and will gain access uh, to the funds that uh, mm. is at the end of uh, of uh, the process. And also, um, we we have great expe expectation of uh, these fourteen these. Uh, initial 14 uh, uh, stakeholders that will accompany this kind of project uh, will be uh, beside the micro enterprises and we have a great expe expectation from them to help us uh, to identify problem and risk and so on trying to uh, propose to in future to our policy maker if they want uh, still to invest it but but i think yes because in our territory this is a big driver the social innovation and if they want to invest more in the future so try to give them uh, really uh, what is the, the the what is not functioned what is better to change what is better to maintain and so we have a a, a, a close community more experienced and a larger one made by the uh, final beneficiary of this kind of program mm. all right thanks so much mm -hmm. Claudia. mark yeah, i think yeah, I think Claudio used those three little letters, KPI, and I think it helps address some of the accountability and responsibility issues. If you set some targets, then you know you're going in that direction or not. And I think, you know, you have a grant system, a number of applicants, number of grantees. I think it's important. And I think it's something, it's the vocabulary that's familiar to most of the participants who have joined us today. So I think in designing your program, designing your policy experimentation, You've got to fix yourself some objectives. Um, if you can put some numbers behind it, it means you can uh, collect uh, some good feedback. My, my last comment, Arnaud, I think, and, and I think all the speakers dealt with it in a different way, um, is the sort of the policy and policymaker stability. I think, Slava, you talked about it in, in terms of being one of your challenges and finding that time frame that allows you to launch this experimentation. Because if you start, or two months before the end of a policy mandate, then you can perhaps just, you can guess the results. Uh, you often use that window of opportunity of enthusiasm at the beginning. And uh, I think just that planning the time scale would be one last takeaway from me. And I think Slavo's got his hand raised and probably say much more yeah. useful than me to say. Yeah, ju just a final uh, point. I think in all these network type of programs where you have a horizontal accountability, the critical first step is... Uh, whether you've got an uh, intermediary who has uh, required capacity and legitimacy. Mm -hmm. If you got that wrong, then things will go bad. You know? okay. so, so that is a crucial point, I think. Uh, Selecting mm -hmm. that good good yeah. broker. Yeah, I'd have to I'd agree. As I said, the examples I gave from the Région Sud, when it was a technology-driven, you had to work with technology clusters that could interpret the uh, what was happening. Um, so I very much support that. Okay, Arnaud, I think we're... Uh, um, yes, coming at the end of time. Yes, we have some run up. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you, close. Mm -hmm. um, thanks so much uh, to our speakers, uh, Claudia, Jan, and Slavo. Was excellent. Thanks so much for for sharing insights and and um, and inspiration and good practices and so on. So thanks so much for being here. Uh, we will write, of course, uh, a follow-up uh, articles with all your presentation and all the insights from uh, this webinar coming soon. And, uh, of course, there will be also a pop-up survey uh, when you close uh, this webinar. So it's important to tell us 
uh, what you thought uh, about this uh, about this webinar, but most important, how can we help you and uh, what type of topics would you like us to, to work on? So thanks so much for all your participants, for your questions and for being here. Thanks so much again, it was great. Thanks Mark for accommodating and until uh, next time. Well, thank thanks you. to our speakers. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you very much, bye-bye.